Hi, I'm Julie Powell and I will be hosting today's Hangout, which is all about macro photography. So for those of you who don't know who I am, I am a photographer based in Melbourne, Australia, um, and I specialise in still life, macro and portraits. So today we're just going to have a little look at some macro photography stuff. So I'm just going to jump in and share my screen. and hopefully you can see that so um i love that there are so many things that you can do and learn with macro photography and you can always keep things interesting um, especially if you feel like you're losing that spark or your creativity there's always something new to learn to get you super excited and back into it again or perhaps it's something old that you haven't done for a while that you can pick up again after a long absence For me, macro is the perfect time to slow down. Take a breath. Um, it's not about how many photos you can shoot or how fast you can edit them and get them up on social media. It's really all about taking the time to be intentional and meaningful with my images. Hi. Everybody jump on late or did I get a kickstart and jump in early? <laughs> hey, Julie. Hi, Michael. Hi, Keith. I can always jump back and start again. I thought, geez, oh. I'm, I'm, nobody's coming in to join me today. And I can only be on for about 20 minutes. I have another conflict. I have another meeting. I mean, I drove down to Colorado Springs, which is where I am now. And the meeting starts in about 20 minutes that I have to go to, but um, I wanted to at least catch part of it. So. No worries. All right. Well, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna jump back in again, and hopefully, I um, I was having some computer issues anyway. So hopefully, maybe restarting it, it might start again. I'm telling it to share screen screen try, two. I, I need to try and figure out how to mute. I'm here on a um, cell phone, and I, I don't see a mute button um oh here we go now i've got it i've got it now you got it okay so let's try again take two and hopefully it'll work this time i was having some some glitching issues myself before so so welcome to today's photo focus hangout we're gonna chat all about macro photography I love that there are so many things to do and learn with photography that you can always keep things interesting. If you feel that you're losing your spark or your creativity, there's always something new to be able to pick up um, to get you super excited and back into it again. Or perhaps it's something you haven't done for a while that you can pick up after a long absence and really get excited again. So for me, macro is the perfect time to slow down and just breathe. It's not about how many photos you can shoot or how fast you can edit them and get them up on social media. It's really all about taking the time to be intentional and meaningful with my images. So what is macro photography? Well, macro photography is the ability to capture up close details of small objects, flowers or insects. But of course you could shoot almost anything in macro. The magnification process of today's macro lenses mean that we can examine the tiny, almost imperceptible details we might otherwise miss. And there's a whole hidden world out there to explore. Now, I'm not going to go into the specific details of the different scales and such. I tend to get a bit confuddled when it comes to all the technical jargon, managing and explaining the differences between um, sensor sizes and pixel counts and one to one and one to two, etc. I shoot what I like when it comes to macro and pretty much everything else. 
whether that is up close or a little further away. I am a creative photographer, not a technical one. But if it's your thing, there are loads of tutorials and such online, and I encourage you to go learn. Basically, it boils down to close, really close, and super close. Like I said, let's keep it simple. What you shoot is entirely up to you, and I'm sure there are probably rules and regulations when it comes to various competitions and such, but I personally don't get all that hung up on it. So what do you need to shoot macro? Obviously, you're going to need a camera. Um, you can use a digital SLR or a mirrorless camera. Even some film cameras, have, you can do macro. And then, of course, there's your smartphones that have also got macro functions as well. Um, you're going to need a macro lens or extension tubes, or you can get special optics for magnifying, especially on some of your creative lenses and your smartphones. So you don't necessarily need a macro lens. Um, the other thing that you really need is a light source, whether that's natural or artificial. And a tripod can be handy and a macro rail can be really, really handy too. I also suggest starting with a stationary object as it's not going to move on you. And patience, you need lots and lots of patience. As photographers, we're always getting asked what gear we use. So I'm currently shooting with a Sony a7R 3 and a Sony 90mm macro lens. I also have a Tamron 70-300mm, which I use with extension tubes. And I also have a Lens Baby Velvet and a Sweet 80, as well as macro filters. I also use from time to time a four-way macro rail, LED lights. I have a small on-camera flash with a diffuser. Sometimes I use a macro ring light. And I have Velo extension tubes and I've got a couple of different tripods and I also tend to use a remote trigger as well. When it comes to traditional macro lenses, there are various different alternatives, each with their own pros and cons and their own uses. I do have a 50mm, which is great. It's lightweight, it was cheap and it's fairly compact but it is a little obtrusive and it gets me a little too close to bees and things like that. So if you like to shoot bugs or things that sting or bite, you might want to look at say a 90 mil, a hundred mil, or even a 200 mil. They allow you to stand a little bit further away um, so that you're not right up into the bugs. Obviously they are bigger, they're heavier and therefore more expensive, but having a better distance and being less obtrusive to your subject might be something that you find really, really handy. Then you have things like lens compression to take into consideration. Now, there's not a lot of lens compression on a 50mm, but the bokeh you get on, say, this 90mm lens, which I shot with this um, on this shot, is absolutely divine, and it's probably my favourite lens. Different makes and models and brands have slightly different compressions too. What to shoot is entirely up to you. There's usually a reason that macro has sparked your interest. So start by exploring that. Inanimate objects are easy to start with. Bugs and insects can be far more difficult. And often the smaller the insect, the faster it can move, especially if they have wings. Even snails and ants can move quite fast when you're trying to catch them. To capture great macro images, you really need great light. And whether that's natural light or artificial light. Natural light is free and often in abundance. But when you are standing so close to your subject, sometimes you are blocking the light. Try using a small reflector to bounce light back up into your subject. Sometimes there just isn't enough light. Perhaps you're in a dark forest capturing fungi. That is where artificial light can help. And it really doesn't matter what you use. You need to find what works best for you. 
ring lights, speed lights, off-camera mini LED panels, they are all fantastic. It depends on your budget and if you want something that leaves your hands free. As you can see in this shot here, one person's holding the lights while another shoots, which is fine, but I find that more often than not, I'm on my own. This is the same fungi that the guys were catch it, capturing, but I captured it with my ring light. If you are using a built-in camera flash, try using it with the power turned right down. It will give you much softer light. It won't look harsh and artificial. Same goes with speed lights and off-camera flashes. These days, I'm more often than not using my Mikey mini flash, which is a tiny little flash, um, and this diffuser, which um, attaches to my lens, which is really quite cool. So it's all lightweight, it's very unobtrusive, totally controllable, and it's super easy to work with. And it pays to work in the shadows for better light. Use the flash and the diffuser to soften the flash. And this can bring out all the details and it also allows for faster shutter speeds. I have used a ring light, they are cheap and lightweight and they work really well and leave your hands free to do other things. Sure, a speed light often puts out more light, but a big one is often too much unless you have a smaller one like my little mini flash. Then you need a snoot or a diffuser and you start carrying so much stuff. LED lights that connect via the hot shoe are also great. You can get them side mounted or top mounted if you prefer. Um, I found that there is a problem when using a ring light with a zoom lens and you get this horrible vignette around the edges. Um, and I've also found that I've had problems when using it with the Lens Baby creative lenses too. So that's why I've switched over to my little mini flash. Um, but I've never found a ring light to be an issue with the macro lens. Um, so they can be a little limiting at times, but it's definitely a much cheaper option. But like I said, you need to find what works best for you and your budget. Artificial light, like the ring light, gives you abundant light on your subject, let, but lets the light fall off really quickly. And I simply adore the effect. Um, try chatting to a macro photographer that you admire and see what they're using. When it comes to studio work, I'm often using a larger speed light because I can put it on a stand away from my scene. So I have the Godox AD200 Pro and I use it with a small diffuser, um, as you can see in the photo here. So I have it pulled a fair way back from my subject on a light stand. This allows me to get great overall light and have complete control within the studio. It's a lot more powerful than my mini um, flash. And as I said, much prefer to have it all totally diffused. Macro lenses aren't just for bugs and flowers either. They're terrific for product shoots, especially my 90mm um, lens. I love it. It's such a beautiful all-round lens. When it comes to studio work, um, speed lights and light tents can be amazing as well for smaller objects, giving you lots of light, but the light is softer and more flattering. So now we've got some of the basics out of the way, let's look at some specifics when it comes to macro photography. I'll try not to get too technical, but there are a few things that we need to look at. So what is the plane of focus? In the simplest of terms, it means that everything on the same plane or level will be at the same focus. Everything else is on a different plane will be in blur. Your plane of critical focus is the exact spot that your focus is on. Everything else on the same plane as your focal point will also be at focus. This is in regards to the horizontal plane. We're not talking vertical here. The plane of focus is directly dependent on your depth of field. So if you're shooting wide open, like at say 2.8, 
you have extremely shallow depth of field and your plane of focus will be rather small. As you change from wide open aperture to something smaller, the focal plane increases. So as you can see by the red bands here, f2.8 is much narrower than the image shot at f9. A basic definition of depth of field is the area of acceptable sharpness within a photo that will appear in focus in every photo. There is a certain area of your image in front of and behind your subject that will appear in focus. It is the distance between the nearest and the furthest objects in the scene that appears acceptably sharp in an image. If everything is in focus, then you have a large depth of field. If very little is in focus, then you have a shallow or a small depth of field. As you see in the image here, 2.8 has very little in focus through the middle of the image on this garlic, whereas F9 has a lot more in focus. The aperture you use is a big factor in determining how much depth of field you get. A small f-stop will produce a small depth of field. A large f-stop will produce a large depth of field. Another factor that you need to keep in mind is the length of your lens and how close you are to your subject. All three of these factors determine how much depth of field you will end up with in your photo. The closer your subject is to the camera, the shallower your depth of field becomes. Therefore, moving further away from your subject will deepen your depth of field. So when you're shooting with macro, you need to be more conscious and more intentional in the decisions you make when it comes to your depth of field. Many people simply jump to f1.8 or 2.8, whatever is the largest aperture for your lens. Then they tend to get into bother with trying to get their focus right. I often find that something more in the range of say f4 to 5.6 is much easier to work with, especially at first when you get, you're just getting used to using the lens. You can even go more to say f9 if it helps you get more in focus. It gets even more complicated when you're working with things like extension tubes or macro filters and lens babies. Even the whole aperture size gets confusing really when you think about it. They're actually fractions of how open the aperture blades or the aperture gap on your lens is. So even though f1.4 sounds small, it's actually wide open, whereas f16 is a fraction of that size and it's more closed in. So let's have a little look at some settings for macro. Things I often use, whether in the studio or out in the field. So what f-stop should you use? It really does depend on the look you want to achieve. If you want to shoot for the blur, which is one of my personal favorites, then you can shoot at f2.8 to say 4.5. This will still have a fairly small depth of field and plane of focus. But when you are starting out, this type of f-stop can be really frustrating and it feels at times you can't quite hit the right focus. So try shooting at a lower f-stop. Go from 5.6 to say f9. It will give you more in focus and an easier time capturing your images. If you really want all the details, you can drop down to a lower f-stop or try focus stacking. And that's something we're going to talk about in a minute. I'm pretty sure you'll all have the exposure con triangle under control. But remember, if you change one variable, you need to change the rest if you're shooting in manual mode. I personally prefer aperture priority and use exposure compensation. I can then dial in the exact aperture I want. And if I need, I can put my ISO on auto with a minimum shutter speed of say 1125. So that allows me to shoot handheld if I want to. 
Um, obviously, the minimum shutter speed is not so, not so necessary if you're using a tripod and a remote trigger. What about shutter speed? Again, it really depends on what your subject is. If you're indoors with no wind, using a tripod, and your subject is not moving, it's all largely irrelevant. Um, add some wind or insects, then you might want to jump up to a much higher shutter speed. If your hand holding your camera, I recommend nothing under 1 80th of a second. If you are using a 90mm macro lens or larger, you really need to be about one and a half times the focal length. So a 90mm, you need to be about 1 1 50th or quicker. If you're shooting bugs, then you probably need to go even faster, say one one thousandth of a second. Whoops. Metering modes. When it comes to macro, I'm usually using spot metering. As I want to meter the light for where my focus is, not necessarily the surrounding image. To be perfectly honest, I rarely use anything else. I know I probably should change it to multi-pattern multi metering or matrix metering for landscapes, but I often forget. And don't forget your composition. Good composition is a key element to a great photo. Learning the rules of composition, which might have been around for hundreds of years, all tried and true, granted in the arts by masters of various mediums, then carried through from art into photography. It's all about creating something that is pleasing to look at. By learning how to compose your images based on some or all of these techniques, you can then create better and more interesting photos. You can also learn about breaking these rules for something more creative rather than rigid. Rule of thirds is probably the most common and well known. But then, of course, there's also the golden spiral, diagonals, fill the frame and more. It's all about leading the viewer's eye through your image. And don't forget the basics, things like white balance. Um, I often use auto white balance or if I'm outside shooting, I might use cloudy day or just try locking in at, say, something like 55,000 Kelvin. It looks really good for outdoor macro. And don't forget to check your background, your foreground elements, make sure there's nothing too distracting. And don't forget your colour theory. It can all be part of your image as well. So just about all of these things that we've covered are as vital in macro as they are in landscape or even in a portrait. So let's look at some gear that can help capture a great macro shot. So everything from extension tubes to macro rails and adding some creative effects. Firstly, let's have a look at extension tubes. What are they and how do they work? Extension tubes are a fabulous way to attach a standard lens to your camera to capture macro images. They allow your lens to focus closer than its normal minimum focusing distance. A standard zoom lens may have a minimum distance of say 50 centimetres, but by using extension tubes, that can be cut to 10 centimetres or less. By creating distance between your camera body sensor and the lens, the focusing distance is shortened and the effect of magnification on your subject is increased. Extension tubes enable macro performance for lenses not otherwise able to focus that close. And there are different types of extension tubes. I prefer the ones with the electronic contacts. So you can see the little brass um, attachments in the, the contacts there. And they will allow my extension tubes, or my lens I should say, to talk to my camera, allowing for things like autofocus and so forth. So these are the extension tubes um, attached. So you attach your lens to the extension tubes and that then attaches to your camera, same way that your lens usually does. And you can use multiple tubes at the same time. They're lightweight and have no glass, so they're pretty easy to throw in your pocket when you're out and about. 
and they cost a mere fraction of traditional macro lenses. So they're a great, great thing to, or great place to start if you're considering macro, but not quite ready to make the jump. They are a little tricky to get used to, but can be an invaluable asset to your kit. So this is a comparison with a standard 50 mil lens. So this was my minimum, minimum minimal focusing distance. Um, then I put on the 16 mil extension tube. And as you can see, I was able to come in much, much closer to focus. And then I put my 10 mil and the 16 mil on, and I can get really, really super close with just a standard 50 mil lens. So something else to consider is auto or manual focus. And sometimes it's a bit of a contentious issue with macro shooters, um, whether to shoot manual or auto. Some say you cannot get correct focus without using manual on a macro shot. And to some degree, it is true. However, as we get older, our eyesight, sadly, is not as sharp. And I find these days I'm relying, relying more and more on my camera as I find it difficult to focus 100% in the viewfinder or the LED, LCD screen. Um, if your camera has a magnifier and peak metering, then these are amazing and can be so helpful. The cameras these days, as long as you have the movable focus placed in the right spot, you can actually zoom in and check your focus. Um, things like Sony's peak meters show you exactly what is in focus. And I think other brands have got it as well now too. I think that using auto to get you 90% of the way there and then fine tuning it is perfectly acceptable. I also love the DMF on the Sony, which allows me to check my fine tuning. It's fabulous. Another thing to consider is where to focus, especially with a wide open aperture like 2.8. When it comes to bugs, aim for their head, um, aim for their eyes if you can. Um, that way the face is in focus and the body can go into a bit of blur. And you can try focus stacking, but honestly, I haven't had much luck with it myself with bugs because they keep moving. Um, but you can put your focus point in the middle or your rule of thirds and move it around until you get the bug in the right spot. When it comes to flowers, pick a hero spot and place it in your composition. Something that leads the eye through the image. If you're super close, choose a petal near the lens or perhaps the stamen. Not everything will remain in focus and that is the beauty of macro. Take note of what is in your background too. Move around so that there's a pleasing background that perhaps highlights or complements your subject. Or you can add a piece of colored card in the background and make it anything you wish really. I love working with water drops. Water drops makes everything more interesting. Fruit, flowers, metal, just about anything looks great in macro with water drops. Get a small spray bottle that you can use to squirt water onto your subjects, especially flowers. Make sure it's small enough to carry with you when you go out shooting and doesn't take up too much room in your bag. I like the Mr. bottles that you can get from the makeup department. They look a lot more like um, dew and things like that as well. Water is great, um, but it can run off really quickly. So if you want your water droplets to last a little longer, try maybe some liquid glycerin. It's clear and it looks just like water, but it's thick and sticky, so it hangs around a little while. You can also mix it one-to-one -one with um, water and put that in your spray bottle. So it's not quite as thick, but it's thicker than plain water. And another thing that I like to do is say saturate a small your flower with water um, and the small mist like dew is great. And then using an eyedropper or a syringe, you can then drop glycerin exactly where you want. So you get those those bigger drops 
um, and then snap away. So, and glycerin is terrific for also adding condensation on glasses as well. And soft drink cans, beer cans, things like that. A few other things to consider when it comes to macro photography is reflectors and bounce cards, which can be as simple as black and white card or phone core, a plamp, um, which you can see in this shot here. Um, so a plamp attaches to your tripod and it can hold reflectors or diffusers or even colored backgrounds. Plamps are also excellent for holding branches or stems steady in the wind without damaging them. Um, they're also handy for, like I said, holding diffusers and scrims to soften a harsh daylight from um, entering into your shot. Um, a bean bag is something else that can be handy. You can use that as stabilisation if you haven't got your tripod, um, say if you're on the ground, um, or like in this image, you can use it to hold your crystal ball. So let's now have a little look at some focus stacking. So what actually is it? Focus stacking is where you take a series of images of the same subject, but capturing slices of different focal planes. Then you merge them all together. So why stack an image? Perhaps you want to shoot at 2.8 to keep the background in blur, but you want your subject from front to back to be in focus. That's where focus stacking can help. Now, this image here is an 11 image stacked photo. I've taken 11 images where my focal point moved from the front of the flower through to the back. So a stacked image involves taking multiple images with multiple focal points of the same subject, moving from front to back or vice versa and moving your focus point along a little at a time. Remember back when I was talking about the focal planes, you were aiming for horizontal slices, like in this oversimplified image here. You will then have to merge them in Photoshop or some other program um, to get the final image. I love using a program called Helicon Soft. Um, I find it absolutely terrific. Um, and using a macro rail is also really, really handy for helping you get that focal point moved. So this is a four axis macro rail. It can move forward and backward or left or right or vice versa. They generally attach to your camera and then to your tripod using a screw. And it's the basic standard thread from a tripod. I'm sure there's different types out there. I know there are some that just move from front to back and then there's also side rails as well. By adjusting the dials, it can gradually move your camera mere millimetres at a time, allowing for precise movements while keeping everything really stable. It's a very handy tool to have. And it can be used for more than just focus stacking too. Excellent for obtaining the perfect focus, whether that's manual or auto. You can try focus stacking without using a rail, but it can be a little hit and miss. Um, also keeping the camera stationary and just moving the focus point itself, I found can also be a bit hit and miss, but feel free to try it. There are also cameras now that do focus stacking in camera. Mine does not. When it comes to macro, I find it's hard to actually go past the Lens Baby creative lenses. It's a world I dived into during the pandemic and all the lockdowns that we had here in Australia. And I dove in pretty deep. I've got the Velvet 56, the Sweet 80, the Edge 50. I've got all the macro filters. Um, I've also got all the Omni creative filters, which can add some really cool effects to your images and not just for macro either. Pretty cool. Lens baby products are challenging to adapt to at first. They are completely manual lenses, manual focus, have an aperture ring on the lens. 
The wide open apertures have incredibly small depth of field due to the velvety swirly bokeh on the edges, which the lenses are famous for. Gorgeous when you get it right, but I found that sticking to a RAND F4 has given me much better results. The Velvet 56 has a macro function that allows you to get quite close to your subject. I find setting the distance and then moving my body and the camera in and out slightly until my peak meter lights up is the way to go. There's no autofocus or DMF here, nothing like that, but I can still use the peak metering. The images are not tack sharp either, which some people find a little bit frustrating. Um, they allow for plenty of definition, um, but they have this soft ethereal quality to them. With the Sweet 80, technically you can't get close enough for true macro, but the 80 does have a pull-out macro section on it. Um, but then you can add the screw-on macro filters that you can get, which allow you to get one, two, or four times closer. Um, and you can stack them together, and they give you quite a lot of magnification. Then there are the Omni Creative filters, as I was saying, which is a set of crystal prisms and wands with coloured film, which allow, um, which attach to an adapter via magnets, and then that adapter screws onto your lens, whether it's macro or normal. Um, and they can give you very arty and creative effects, and they can be loads of fun to play with. <clears throat> So what do you do if you don't have a macro lens or even a lens baby? Another thing that I'd love to do is shoot with my zoom lens. I have a 70 to 300 Tamron lens and it's perfect for macro, especially if you add the extension tubes. I love the blur. Sure, you can't get your lens in super close, even with the extension tubes, but you do have that zoom. So even if you only have a prime lens 24 to 70 if you add the extension tubes you can get in pretty close um, and you can stack your images with a standard lens as well so that's about it grab your lens get out capture some macro especially in the early morning just after the rain is a perfect time to go so thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed this presentation and if there are any questions, then let me know. And you're the only one left here, Keith. Yes. Thank you very much. It was a really good presentation. Thank you. Did you have any questions? Uh, not really. I have considerable experience with macro photography, so I, uh, I, I just I didn't realize what the subject was going to be, and I just I just finished one other Zoom uh, presentation, and and yours uh, popped up, so I thought I'd uh, look in and see uh, what you were doing. Uh, but I I did like your presentation. I, I'll I'll tell you I'm a retired um, university professor. Um, I taught photography at the Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. Okay. Yep. So I have a lot of experience teaching students uh, a lot of this. Um, so so cool. I, thought, I thought you did a very good, and since you recorded this, uh, it'll be very useful for other people. So hopefully they, uh, yeah, we had, we had a little bit of a, a glitch early on, so I don't know what was happening there, but hopefully the recording's all going through and um, yeah, and it'll, uh, they'll be able to edit that and pop that up on the page so that other people can have a look at it. So it might just be the time or something like that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's re really great to record something like this because somebody can uh, go back to this over and over again and, and brush up on the details. Yep, yep. Yeah. So try not to get too technical because that tends to bog people down sometimes, but. Um, well, I thought yeah. your, your information was really well presented. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Well, I guess if there's nothing else to to chat about and talk about, we can probably it's almost time anyway. So um, yeah, thanks for joining me. Well, maybe and, I'll um, see you in another one of the uh, 
the group uh, meeting sometime. No worries. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.